Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here, and I am Dustin Heiser with AMEC Foster Wheeler, and we are pleased this morning to be a premier sponsor of this inaugural Georgia Brownfield Association seminar. AMEC is a global consultancy company focused on serving our clients with over 40,000 professionals in over 50 countries in the environment and infrastructure, mining, oil and gas, and um, clean energy markets. As a founding organization member of the Georgia Brownfield Association, we are committed to the redevelopment of brownfield sites in Metro Atlanta and throughout the state of Georgia. Some of our example projects um, you'll see here on the slides um, range from Atlantic Station with Jacoby Development early on, um, Atlanta Beltline Inc. in the Atlanta Beltline redevelopment, um, the Ford Hapeville site redevelopment, and currently we're working with the integral group on the former General Motors site redevelopment. So um, it's a pleasure to work with all those clients on all those great um, uh, key redevelopment projects. We know that it takes strong partnerships and a collaborative team in order to have successful redevelopment projects. And that's why we're excited to tee up this regulatory panel discussion. Both EPA and the Georgia Environmental Protection Division have been key agencies for making property redevelopment possible, and we are thankful to them for that. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to introduce Gerald Pouncey, partner with Morris Manning and Martin and past president of the Georgia Brownfield Association who will facilitate this important session. I personally have had the pleasure of working with Gerald for the past 17 years, and I'm grateful to him for his commitment he has had in leading redevelopment throughout the state of Georgia in his career. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dustin. If I can, let me have the panelists come up for the next panel, which I think is Holly Hill, Allen, and Beth. If y'all can come up while I'm giving a few introductory remarks, we can, and then we can then start the panel. Dan, how many folks do we have here today? 170? Well, congratulations. That, that is a great turnout. Congratulations to the GBA for what they've done. And it is uh, it's surprising as I look out to see 170 people when we think about the organization, how we started four years ago, five years ago. It is, uh, it, it's really a credit to what the organization has accomplished and to many of you and your efforts. And, and I, let me, as I, as I introduce the panelists, let me mention a couple of comments first. One is, and this is appropriate in light of the comments from Michael and from Jonathan, is that the, as you look at two, I'm always brought back to the two primary goals of the George Brownfield Association have been, one is to return property to a productive reuse, which generally is going to mean job creation. And second, to do that in a way that, uh, that adequately protects and appropriately protects the environment, and, and at least with the Georgia Brownfield Law, enhances the environment. Uh, that's been a mission of our organization, uh, and, and one of the things that, that all the leadership has always been committed to is maintaining that focus, and I think we've done so very well over the years. Uh, how many of y'all are familiar with the Georgia Brownfield Law? They ask a show of hands. And how many of y'all have actually used it on a particular site? So, so a good, good show of hands. Let me, uh, and, and without uh, stealing Holly's thunder, the history of the Brownfield Law goes back, or at least the current version of it goes back to 2002. And in essence, what the law said is, is if you come in as an innocent purchaser, that, uh, that we're going to give you and come in and actually clean up the source materials, what's contributing to the problem, we're going to give you as a buyer certain, certain protections uh, which will run with the land. Uh, and in addition, we're going to give you an economic incentive through some relief on your tax increases that also is designed to spur that development. And there have been some changes over the years, which, uh, which Holly will discuss, but that has, that's the Brownfield Law at, at its fundamental core. Now, but you keep that in mind, and I'm going to fast forward to uh, a meeting that I actually had about, uh, uh, about two months ago, three months ago. I was asked by uh, Matthew Sanslow House and by uh, Gwen Keyes. Uh, Matthew is the uh, assistant administrator for EPA and heads OSRA. And, uh, and, and Gwen, as many of you know, is the is former uh, regional administrator here and, the, uh, and current EPA chief of staff. And the, the meeting was sold to discuss what EPA can do with respect to furthering brownfield redevelopment across the country. 
And as we met in the tour, there were, each of them had an assistant there, so there were five of us. And as we met, there were three things that EPA focused on with respect to this, to what they can do and what their observations have been with respect to how brownfield development is accomplished. What do you think the first one was? The number one issue was the state implementation of brownfield programs. That is what, that is what they identified as the item which is most facilitated the, the redevelopment of, of brownfield properties across the country. I think that's a real credit to this program and to other programs that, that, that EPA recognizes that and recognizes that at such a senior level. So I think that's something that we should keep in mind as we look at, as we look at how we move forward with these programs and how our program rates in, in comparison to other programs. The other comment we discussed there is that while a number of the states may have economic incentives that may be more significant. There's some enhanced tax relief or tax credits that are given uh, by some of the other states. Uh, very few of the states have the liability protection that so clearly runs with the land, that's so fundamental uh, for a lot of what we do and you do in the state of Georgia. So that's the other, uh, that's the other item that I would note that is, has been so significant with respect to the program. And the final item, and, and Beth, this is a credit to you and, and to your program, both in terms of its history and currently, is how streamlined you have made the process, and it's streamlined without affecting the actual integrity of the cleanup that takes place. And, and that's been another fundamental issue for our program, fundamental aspect of our program, which, which causes it to, uh, to exceed so many of its, uh, of its uh, state counterparts in other states with regard to the effectiveness of the program and with regard to the number of sites that have been in the program. Uh, interestingly, the other item, there were, there were two other items that they mentioned in this meeting, one of which uh, we also may have the opportunity to discuss here, and that is the, uh, that's the grant program, which, uh, which is so significant to what goes on with many of the municipalities. So with that as an introduction, what I'd like to do is introduce uh, two of our panelists. Uh, uh, Beth, and I think our third is coming up, Alan, I see you now walking up. Uh, I'll introduce Beth first. Beth has been the head of the Brownfield program in, in Georgia now for, since October. I think October of 2014, and and for those of you who have have worked with Beth, she has uh, uh, has stepped into that role with a predecessor that had been there for 12 years and just done a remarkable job in maintaining uh, the type of focus that we've talked about on both encouraging redevelopment as well as providing an economic as well as providing uh, a mechanism that both uh, sustains and enhances the environment. Second panelist is Holly Hill. And Holly has been, uh, I'm not gonna ask you how long you've been a uh, lawyer with Troutman Sanders, but I've known Holly most of my professional career. And, uh, and she, has, uh, she has always been at the uh, forefront of the environmental issues that we deal with, particularly as it relates to Brownfield. And so it has, she and I have, have worked on uh, a number of legislative efforts over the years, particularly on the state side. And, I, and I've always enjoyed working with her. And the third panelist, Alan, you and I, I know we've, we've met each other, we've not had a chance to, to work directly together on a, a number of items, but Alan Farmer heads the, uh, is the director of EPA's Region 4 Resource Conservation and Restoration Division, and I think he'll speak directly to some of the issues we talked about in terms of grants and availability. So, uh, do, we, do y'all prefer to stand or sit during the presentation? I'm gonna stand. Okay. Gonna well, I think, uh, I think with Holly, Stan. Okay. Holly, I think we're starting with you on where we have gone with the regulatory program, and I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Thank you, Gerald. Um, how do I go to the next slide? Oh, oh here we go. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Holly Hill, and I've been with Troutman Sanders for 23 years, so a long, long time. Um, I was asked to speak on these two topics, highlights of the legal changes in 2014, and it was a very busy year, and then what is ahead um, in 2015. I have the pleasure of being the chair of the Government Affairs Committee for the Georgia Brownfields Association, and so I've gotten um, to do a lot on behalf of the association and work with people at EPD. Um, and really, I, I believe a theme of the 2014 and hopefully going into 2015 really was a very beneficial partnership with GBA and uh, EPD. 
Um, the first thing I'd like to discuss is the, um, I'll try to hit a little bit on the process for each of these three um, changes. The first was the Georgia Brownfield Act legislation. The second one I will talk about is the HISRA legislation that was going on at the same time. And the last are the changes to the HISRA regulations with a focus on what benefits uh, the Brownfields program. Um, the first, though, let me talk about the uh, Georgia Brownfields Act legislation. The efforts there, really, with the uh, GBA, and this is the association, uh, began in 2012 and 2013, and we tried to get legislation passed in 2013, but it just was not successful for a number of reasons. Um, so after that, the, um, the Governmental Affairs Committee of the GBA and the GBA worked as a committee and as an organization to try to see what um, legislative changes to the what was known as the Hazardous um, Site Reuse and Redevelopment Act. Gerald, I think you said it was passed in 2002. I think we worked on that, and I'm giving you that name. It was a horrible name. Um, but, uh, but Gerald worked to get it changed, um, and that to me was one of the best things about the legislation. Um, we met as a committee several times. We also partnered with um, Beth's program, EPD, and the Georgia Brownfields um, EPD uh, program. And that was a great partnership. They felt like they, um, I, I think this is correct, needed to clean up some things in the act and also really codify some things that they were doing as a program. And so we worked together. Um, we also, GBA, spent some of its money and hired a lobbyist, which I found out was um, a great thing to do, someone who knows the process and can um, help you work through the process. Um, as a committee, we worked on some statutory changes. The bill was introduced in the House February 7th, and we felt like it was pretty uh, non-controversial. Move through the program, I think, if everybody remembers 2014, there was that snow issue um, a couple of times. And through one of the snow issues, and I think, Gerald, you had a, some shoulder issue as well, um, had surgery, and he got down there and testified. Things were rocking along with these changes. Um, and then we started to run into some opposition. The one thing I did learn about the legislative session, and people probably know this who've dealt with it, is it's unfortunate that there's very little time in that legislative process in Georgia, and I'm sure federal too, where there's time for a dialogue to talk to people who um, think, well, you're trying to say this when the intent of the legislation is not that. And so we ran into some opposition um, and we tried to work with folks down there. We tried to educate the representatives as well. And that's, you know, they're looking at all different types of issues. Um, they did a great job. But again, oftentimes they're, they just haven't been able to study the issue and dialogue with the people trying to get these changed. So there were a number of hearings, both in the subcommittee um, and then it went to the House committee, and it made it out of the House, um, and then it went to the Senate. Again, there was opposition, um, and apparent, I was not there, but uh, apparently a, an amendment was defeated, and then it did pass the Senate as well. And um, the governor signed the bill at the end of April, and it went into effect um, in July. The major changes to the um, Brownfield legislation. Like I said, it is no longer the Hazardous Site Reuse and Redevelopment Act, but it is now simply the Georgia Brownfield Act, which is terrific because it takes away the negative connotation that hazardous may have in that name and just very simply identifies what it addresses. 
Um, the other thing was uh, that was very helpful, I think, to Brownfields and the program is it expanded the eligibility um, of the program through the definition of property interest. Um, that goes to any property interest in the property. So it doesn't have to be exclusive and it doesn't have to be ownership as in fee simple. Um, bottom line is uh, you don't have to acquire the property to actually be eligible for the program. An easy example is a tenant can be eligible for the Brownfields program. So it's very expansive definition now. Um, another uh, change was the clarification to hazardous waste facility before a property that was a hazardous waste facility was excluded from the program. Now it has to be a hazardous waste facility that currently holds a, a TSD permit. So um, that, that was a positive change as well. And another thing it did was it codified the 30-day grace period so that if you go ahead and purchase the property, but then apply for the Brownfields program 30 days after that purchase or acquiring the interest, then it can relate back, the limitation of liability can relate back to that um, uh, purchase or acquiring the interest. And um, another positive thing, the last thing it did was clarify the transferability of, limita of the limitation of liability um, letter. It still, however, does not allow for um, people or companies who have contributed to the contamination at the property to be eligible for the limitation of liability. Oh, whoops, back up. Okay, quickly, simultaneously with that, um, the one change to the HISRA, uh, or the, um, the actual statute now, the legislation that was moving simultaneously through under a different bill, because obviously it's a different act, um, and it was passed as well. Um, there was a change to the HISRA statute Whereas before, if, you were, if your site was listed on the hazardous site inventory, you could not appeal that listing. That has changed so that if your site um, was listed on the HSI af on or after July 1st of 2014, you can now appeal that listing. And I mention that just because that is a major change to the HISRA legislation, and that could have an impact on a Brownfields um, site. Uh, the other big change was to the HISRA regulations. Um, I mentioned that the governor signed the uh, Brownfields bill in the end of April, effective July of 2014. EPD did not rest. They um, convened a stakeholder um, committee to look at some changes to the HISRA regulations. And they reached out to a um, number of stakeholders, industry, environmental groups, and Georgia Brownfield Association was um, uh, pleased to be a stakeholder. Dan Grogan, who you heard from at the very beginning of this program, was our representative on that uh, stakeholder group. Um, he reached out to the uh, our, my committee, the Government Affairs Committee, and we met, reviewed the changes that EPD had proposed, and we weighed in um, both through Dan and those committee meetings, as well as through um, written comments on the changes that we felt were beneficial to the Brownfields program and the GBA mission. Um, just quickly through the process, they went out for a public hearing in July, had public comments, I think, at the end of July, and then uh, the board, it was presented to the board on August 26th of 2014, and GBA um, did speak on behalf of those changes and urged the board to adopt those changes, um, and we... Uh, we wanted all of the changes, but in particular, the ones that supported the Brownfields program. Um, 
and those were adopted and they were effective October 14th of 2014. Quickly, there were three highlights that we feel benefited um, the Brownfields program. One is it eliminated, again, this was two um, changes to the HISRA uh, regulations. It eliminated double reporting under both the Brownfields program and the HISRA program for soil releases. So in other words, if you've reported under the Brownfields program and EPD knows about it, even as you're moving through your um, corrective action, approved corrective action, you do not have to turn around and then report under HISRA. Um, the second one is under the HISRA regulations now, you can ask for a 90-day deferral listing on the you know, to see if you qualify to be on the HSI. And that gives um, prospective uh, purchasers under the Brownfield or anyone a chance to do further testing and perhaps clean up the property so maybe your site will not be listed. And the last one was a delisting of type five. As long as you have a uniform environmental covenant, your site can then come off the HSI, and we think that's very positive for brownfield programs. Um, there were several other changes that I'll just mention um, that I think are very positive as well. There's no more delineation to background for um, soil or groundwater. It's uh, based on residential risk reduction standards now. Um, the notification for groundwater under HISRA has changed, and again, that is, um, to the MCL, and the last one is there's a single public notice. Uh, before, you used to have to do both the legal organ and the major newspaper of circulation. Now it's just to the uh, legal organ for CSRs and CAPS. Um, and then my final uh, subject is plans for 2015. Uh, we did not have any uh, legislation in this past session, but uh, the, uh, my committee is working, our big uh, focus this year is to try to look at the VRP and extend certain um, benefits available under the VRP to the Brownfields program. We have met as a committee and we have begun dialogue with uh, Beth and EPD and the Brownfields program that is in very early discussions um, I think now it is back on uh, GBA and the Governmental Affairs Committee to work through a list and the things that we see would uh, be effective from the VRP to apply to Brownfields and go back to EPD with that. So I would encourage you, if you're interested, have ideas, please come see me. Um, we would welcome all voices. Thank you very much. Uh, when we talk about it, and Holly did a great job going over the, uh, the changes that have occurred and what's happened the last few years with the, with the Brownfield program, some of the related programs, but in terms of what has been the meaningful effect on the ground, uh, Georgia's primary enforcement vehicle, the way they got properties cleaned up, uh, really for the first, ten, I guess the, from early 90s through 2000s, uh, was the, their Superfund law. And if you take the Superfund law, it, it, it now has been in effect in Georgia for over 20 years. And if you take the, and then the Brownfield program, while it was passed in 2002, I think the program was actually not up and running until really late three, early four. So, so in terms of time frame, it's really been around 04 to 2014. So roughly half the time as the Superfund program. If you look at the number of sites that have been handled by each of those programs, I think it's roughly now the same. I think it's somewhere in the 600 range, maybe a little bit more for the Brownfield program, 600 maybe a little bit more for the Superfund program. Yet in half the time, uh, you've had almost as many sites, maybe now more, almost as many sites get to closure in the Brownfield program as you have in enforcement. And, and that's not to say that enforcement doesn't play a valuable role but what that does say that if you can create a program that incentivizes people to get out and conduct cleanup themselves, 
including economically. And you do it in a way that, which that program has in a way that's facilitate, that facilitates the type of transactions that, that this program is designed to facilitate, that it, it, does, it can have just a tremendous benefit on the environment. And I think that's a real credit to the program. It's a real credit to how EPD has embraced the program. And Beth, I know it's something that, uh, it's something that you've continued, and we thank you for that. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Beth and let her talk about some of the issues uh, that we see going forward with EPD on the Brownfield program. A PK, but I cannot stand still, <laughs> so I will be moving around as well. I don't have that excuse. Uh, but I just wanted to pick up where Holly left off and talk about the partnership that exists between the private sector, the practitioners, um, and the state regulatory agency, EPD, with the Brownfield program, because it's, it's what Gerald was saying. It's why we have these results that we have. Um, but, you know, when the Brownfield program started, it's my understanding that there was a recognized uh, goal, really, by both the real estate sector and the state sector to say, look, we have a mutual interest to clean up properties here, so why don't we leverage that interest and move this forward through the Brownfield program with the incentives that were created? And to that extent, you know, we've always recognized that private sector as a partner in these dealings and try to be very uh, responsive to their concerns and also to their timetables. So when Holly was mentioning the 2014 legislation, you know, part of that came from the GBA and the development community saying, look, we just can't get on the property, uh, for instance, the 30-day late back. We just can't get on the property. We want to go in the Brownfield program, but we're not able to get the owner to let us test. And so the Brownfield program, of course, our whole objective is to get properties cleaned up. So we want to make cons um, concessions and changes where uh, available to help those properties come in. And that's exactly what happened in 2014 with some of those legislative changes. And I hope to continue to do that to the extent that we're able. Um, but that is basically why um, we have a lot of these results. And these results I'm going to talk about, this is evidence of our shared success. You know, certainly EPD feels that we're doing a great job getting these properties that are protective of human health and the environment back into productive use. But the private sector is helping us tremendously, tremendously with this. And I think even though the Brownfield program can measure those risks, and can contain them, it still does require some risk. And so we're appreciative of all of you who take those risks on a daily basis. Um, but yeah, our results to date, we have um, now had to turn this presentation in it last week. So we might have 596 <laughs> applications. But we have 595 uh, applications received to date. And that represents almost uh, over 8,000 acres in the program. And, of those 595 applications, 324 have received their final limitation of liability. That means they've completed their corrective action. EPD has concurred with their compliance status report and issued that final LOL, and that property is back um, into active reuse, and that represents uh, 3,000 acres. So again, I think this is evidence of shared success, and if you feel proud of these numbers, you should, because we, we certainly do. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about some trends that we're seeing. I think that we get certain questions over and over again, and if you've had some of these questions, maybe we can, we can have a dialogue today about them. But the first question we've gotten lately is, what about a type five for a brownfield property? Uh, what about putting an environmental covenant using some institutional controls on a brownfield property? And we receive these questions with, um, I would say, some measured um, inquisitiveness because you know, the whole point of a brownfield program, uh, in addition to the limitation of liability, is to get that property back into active reuse and sort of remove any stigma that it may have had because there was contamination on site or possible contamination on site, perceived contamination. So when we have applicants looking into a type five, they are really weighing the, the pros and cons there because with the type five, 
and then institutional control, you are going to record an environmental covenant, and that is going to be in your deed record, um, you know, for the foreseeable future. So I think we have some folks who absolutely have to use it. There's really no other way for them to go about cleaning up the property. And then we have others who are really borderline, and they're thinking about implications in the future. Is this going to affect the marketing of the property? You know, we're going through all this trouble to get the property into uh, productive and active reuse, and we want to market that that way, and we don't want to necessarily point out that there is contamination, and they're trying to figure out what that, what that break point is. Uh, we've done about four type fives. We have a couple others in the works, and we're just going to see how that plays out, but essentially we have um, the, the regs dictate that standard, uh, the practicability of a type five, and right now we're proceeding on a case-by-case -case basis because it is something quite new to the Brownfield program, but like I said, we have started to do that um, a bit more and certainly getting more interest in that. Another thing that's happened recently is uh, a request for your final limitation of liability prior to closing. And I think as the program was originally envisioned, and Daryl, correct me if I'm wrong about this, but the whole goal was to get that property in the program, get your corrective action plan approved, get your provisional limitation of liability prior to closing, and then start corrective action. I think that's the majority of our projects sort of go through that time frame. As the, as the program has increased in popularity, and as we're getting um, interest from out-of-state investors or out-of-state practitioners that are not familiar with the program, we've started to see more of an interest in, hey, we need our final limitation of liability. We need to perform all the corrective action, have you concur with our CSR before we can close. And as a program, we're trying to figure out how to handle this. Um, because certainly there are some things that are out of our control with issuing a final limitation of liability. We do all that we can in-house to be efficient, but there's some things that we can't control in terms of um, the limitation of liability being issued. So my advice to you, if, if you find yourself in that situation, is try to figure out why that's happening. Is it an issue of cost? Does the lender need to know, hey, is there any more corrective action that's going to be required by EPD? Are you finished? Because if that's the case, we can think about solutions such as, you know, concurring with the corrective action and having that been completed. Um, and we can talk about ways to get around that. If you do absolutely need your LOL prior to closing, then try to back it that date as much as possible. I know real estate closings are a moving target. We all know that. But it provides our staff with a little bit more time to maneuver the time frame that's being asked of us. We can always uh, move very quickly on approving corrective action plans and issuing that provisional LOL, but the final gets a little bit more tricky. And again, I would submit to you, they have the same effect. Your provisional LOL is essentially going to be your, your final LOL, and that should be sufficient for the lending institution or the pr practitioner you're working with. So hopefully that will answer some questions. But that's something we've started to see more, and we try to be responsive to that. But we do come uh, from time to time run into issues with that. Finally, vapor. Who doesn't have questions about vapor? Um, <laughs> we are getting a lot of questions about vapor, and you know, EPD does have a working group that's tirelessly looking at this. Um, you know, I think everything is so up in the air. No pun intended, or maybe it should be. Um, but you know, I think there's just there's just a lot that we don't know that we're trying. Everyone's trying to hedge their bets. <laughs> And especially in the Brownfield program, where in large part we are such an economic development program, and these properties are going to probably be turned over uh, down the road, our applicants are really trying to think about how do we manage our risk three years into the future, five years into the future. And so we are seeing a more conservative approach because, as we all know, in an economic, um, if you're going to the, to the pro forma, you have a lot better chance of coming out on top if you mitigate for vapor in the redevelopment and the construction phase than retrofitting later. So where they can, if this is a, a redevelopment and true construction, people are choosing to mitigate up front and they're being conservative about that just to manage those risks, you know, because no one knows what's going to happen with that. 
So um, looking ahead, kind of the goals for the program, well, I think that, uh, I've said this before, we have, we have properties in 62 counties around the state. But as you can imagine, a large majority of those are in the metro Atlanta region. And I, I do not for one second believe that metro Atlanta has the monopoly on contaminated properties. I think there are lots of properties that could benefit from the Brownfield program outside of metro Atlanta. So I think that it'd be a, it's, it's a good time to sort of revamp our education efforts across the state. I've been traveling to um, the coast a great bit to talk about the advantages of the Georgia Brownfield program. Um, I think it is an economic development program that is protective of human health and the environment. And I think there's a lot of potential there. Um, we've gone to Athens. Uh, we are looking at West Georgia. But there's a lot of potential out there, and I think that's going to extend more and more with our outreach. Um, I also think there's a lot of partnerships, uh, traditional and non-traditional, to leverage. And for an example of that, I think uh, Alan's going to talk about EPA grants, but we're seeing a lot with city and county governments partnering for mixed-use developments. And maybe they also want to have a green space or a recreational facility. That is a perfect place to partner. You can do economic development with your mixed use, and you can do green space with city and county. Um, you can do you know, public health facilities, and EPA is a great partner in that. At the state level, the Georgia Environmental Facilities Authority has a lot of grants available and some low interest loans. And so what I'm really trying to do is sort of connect those dots and leverage those funds so that we can all across the state take advantage of what's out there um, to put some really interesting projects together. And with that, I'm going to segue over to Alan so we can talk more about those EPA grants. <laughs> and, and Beth, let me mention yeah. one thing. Uh, it is uh, one thing about those numbers, the 324 that she mentioned, is I hope we all realize that that was accomplished during a time frame where almost half of that time really from 07 through 2011, was eaten up by the worst real estate recession that Atlanta has seen perhaps since the, the Great Depression. I mean, it, it was just awful out there in, in, the, in Georgia. And so that really puts into perspective the, how significant this program has been when you carve that component of it out of, out of those numbers and, and take those years. So I think that's a real credit, just once again, to the program and what it's done. The other thing I would note, two of the comments, one is that the other thing the Brownfield program has done, if you take the deals that were done before 2007, or before maybe 2008, before 2008, there's a period of time where there's a lot more margin in those deals. Mm -hmm. What we have seen, uh, and what I think Everett will speak to, is certainly the margin has dropped that are in those deals on a going forward basis since they started happening again in 2011, 2012. If we look at all the transactions that come back to us, that, that is redevelopment on the same spot that had been proposed pre-2008, pre they're all scaled down deals. And so the certainty of that and the ability to get the lenders who are now underwriting to a much more, to much stricter degree, to get those comfortable, that's where the Brownfield program becomes even much more effective, is trying to bridge that gap where you have lower margin and you have greater lender underwriting that's occurring. Uh, the, the final comment I'll make, which is the transition over to Alan, is uh, I, I have never really been educated, as I should have educated myself, regarding just the, the role that, Brown, that these grants play in incentivizing Brownfield redevelopment. Uh, I got an education, uh, somewhat at my expense, when I was meeting with, with Matthew in, in, uh, in DC. <laughs> but it is really, if you, particularly if you look at the municipal side and improving some of the public-private side, uh, these, these, uh, the investigation and work these grants play in local communities is, uh, is just fundamental. And so with Beth, with that, I'm gonna turn it uh, over to Alan to talk about these, these roles. Thank you, Beth and, and Gerald. It's really a pleasure to be here with you all today. Um, I love having opportunities to talk about brownfields. 
I have the, the pleasure of having other responsibilities at EPA as well, including enforcement and permitting and um, sustainable materials management and, and a number of other things. But there's not any of those topics that um, seem to en engender the positive response that the Brownfields program does that I have, have the pleasure of talking about. One thing I'd like to do before I proceed on is recognize my staff who are here today. I know I've got a number of staff and managers here from EPA Region 4's office, so if you'd at least raise your hands. Some in the back and some in the front. Um, I'm really blessed with having a very, very passionate staff. They're passionate about Brownfields and what they do, and they're really good at what they do. Uh, they make us all look good uh, here at, in our regional office. And there's two people I know who've been working with the Georgia Brownfields Association for a number of years, and that's uh, Camilla Warren and David Agater, who happen to be sitting up here in the front. And so I did want to recognize them for the efforts they've made uh, working with the, the GBA to date and will continue to make. One quick thing about EPA Region 4, we, we actually are a little bit unique in, in Region 4 um, as opposed to the other regional offices, the other nine regional offices. They all have their Brownfields program within their Superfund division. Ours is within what used to be called our Resource Conservation and Recovery Act division, RICRA uh, for short. And now we've changed our name as a result of a recent reorganization to um, the Resource Conservation and Restoration division. But we felt like years ago that housing the Brownfields program along with the Corrective Action, RICRA Corrective Action program and the Underground Storage Tank program would provide some benefits of having our cleanup staff sitting close by uh, to each other and having the opportunity to talk about their experiences, and it really has paid dividends. Um, how many of you here today were able to attend the um, National Brownfields Conference that was here in Atlanta back in 2013? Oh, almost everybody, quite, quite a few. Well, I do want to stop here and before I forget it, thank the Georgia Brownfields Association for your help, um, helping Camilla in particular, and all of us in Region 4 in putting that conference on. We certainly could not have done it um, alone, and we didn't do it alone. We reached out to many of you here in this room for assistance in setting up events for that huge national conference, which was, by all accounts, a big success in bringing a lot of people together to talk about uh, the Brownfields um, program. So thank you very, very much for what you've done. And I, we I heard earlier that GBA has been around since I think somebody said 2010 or 11, uh, meeting actively. And so it's a young organization, but believe it or not, here within our eight state region, it's further along and further advanced than any other association is um, outside of Florida. Florida has a very robust and active conference uh, or association. Um, we have some other states that are in the formative stages, but they don't have the organization that you guys do yet. So some of our other states that are talking about Brownfields associations will be looking to see what Georgia is able to do over the next few years and, and what you've already been able to do. One thing I wanted to just talk about here is um, what the associations do, what Florida has been able to do, what associations have been able to do in other regions, and what you guys have already been able to do in the few years that you've been very active here. Um, there's a lot of expertise here in this room. We've heard some of it already today. We'll hear more this afternoon. You have the knowledge base uh, that is needed to, to take this program forward. I mentioned uh, education role, uh, in particular for state legislators. Um, here in Georgia, that has already been happening. We've heard a lot about that this morning. But in other states, not quite as much. Uh, there's still a lot of room for education by, um, I think, from the people like you in this room uh, with the Georgia Brownfields Association and other associations to educate not only state legislatures but county commissioners, mayors, and others about uh, the benefits of, of the Brownfields program. Outreach, uh, Beth talked about that. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later on in, in my uh, presentation, is huge. We can't do enough outreach ourselves. Uh, we do rely very heavily on our state coordinators like Beth and her counterparts in our other states. We took the approach a number of years ago that we really needed to try and, and encourage 
all of our eight states to have um, outreach coordinators, brownfields coordinators that were really reaching out to the communities that needed to submit proposals. Um, I think the Georgia Lottery says you can't win if you don't play. Well, for, from, from our grants, you, you can't receive a grant if you don't submit a proposal. Um, it is a very, very competitive process, and it's people like you here in this room who have done a, a good job already, but there's a lot of room to grow in getting more proposals submitted from Georgia, and I'll, I'll show you those numbers a little bit later. And then networking with other state associations. I've mentioned that. Uh, we've already heard from Alabama and, and Mississippi that they'll be looking to see, for example, what Georgia is able to do in the next few years. They've been looking longingly at Florida for a number of years, um, and now is as good a time as any to say, uh, of all the regional administrators I've had the, the pleasure of working for, each and every one of them, including Gwen Keyes Fleming, who Gerald mentioned a moment ago, have all asked me, why is it that Florida has so many more Brownfields grants? Uh, why do they have so much more success in achieving Brownfields grants from uh, the agency than other states? And one of the reasons is because they have a very active um, association. They do a really good job, and there are people here in this room who have worked with Florida and, and know how that has, has happened and have been responsible for some of those successes. They also have a lot of potential brownfield sites, but so does Georgia, and so does Alabama, so does Mississippi, and, and all of our states. So what can we do to try and support the, the GBA? Well, certainly we can attend your meetings like this one today, and we'll continue to do that. Um, one of the things we'd like to do is continue to encourage our new grantees and all grantees to attend at least one Brownfields meeting a year. Uh, we think it's very important. And what we've seen with our workshops and our meetings is that the grantees certainly talk to each other. They help each other a lot. And we think there's a lot of potential for the association, state associations, to also network and help each other quite a bit. Um, one of the things that we've done since I've been involved in the Brownfields group is we've always held a new grantee workshop or meeting every year. We held those in state locations a long time ago, and then more recently they've been, I don't know how many years in a row, Cindy, they've been here in Atlanta, quite a few years. Um, and so that's a good thing, but what we'd like to do is maybe move those around some to um, state association meetings so that we can bring those people uh, along with them to, to the meetings, encourage them certainly to attend uh, association meetings, including Georgia. We won't. We won't move them all out of Atlanta. Uh, we'd like to have them here as well. And then partners. We're always looking for other partners um, to work with us, either on outreach or on education. And one of the ones that is intriguing to me, and we've, we've talked recently about this, is land banks. Um, I'm not an expert on land banks. Uh, certainly I wouldn't profess to be, but this is a very interesting survey uh, that the Center for Community Progress put together on land banks in the United States. I think their survey came up with about a 120 land banks. So we're interested in finding out more about how we can work with them, um, as you'll see, or you, maybe you can't see, but uh, th this is actually the cover page of the report. And Georgia actually has, I think, um, Georgia, Ohio, and I'm not sure which the other state was, maybe. Michigan, yeah, Georgia, Ohio, and Michigan have more land banks than any of uh, other states in this country. And right, you know, right here in this area, the Fulton County Atlanta Land Bank exists. Uh, we've had discussions with them, and we'll continue to do that just to see if there are, are some opportunities for leveraging with land banks that, that we've missed, quite frankly, in, in the past. And then, as promised, I told you I'd talk a little bit about the the numbers and statistics for our grant program. Um, what you'll see here, and I hope you can read it, is the number of EPA Region 4 assessment revolving loan fund, that's the RLF, and cleanup um, awards here in, in this region. And this is for all of our eight states, and we've got Georgia in red there uh, for, F obviously, for FY fiscal year 15. Those are pending. Those announcements haven't been made yet. But in uh, 2014, two in Georgia, and 13, four in Georgia. 
and then you'll see the, the amount of funding uh, at the bottom of, the, of that, uh, that table. In 2014, 10, 10 million, um, $649,999. I'm not sure how we missed out on that last dollar. <laughs> we'll, we'll have to do better. I'm, I'm sure there's a good story there. And then in 2013, $13,200,000 there. Um, and so, again, there are a lot of opportunities here in Georgia for reaching out. I'll show you also the um, assessment and revolving loan fund and cleanup, ARC, uh, ARC proposals that were submitted in the various years. You'll see 2013, 14, 15, and then we've also included the population of the, of the various eight states in that right-hand column just to um, make us feel a little bit worse here in Georgia for <laughs> how we've, we've been able to fare. And obviously I live in Georgia and my staff does too, so we, we really have a vested interest in trying to uh, improve these numbers somewhat uh, for the proposals that are, that are submitted. You'll see in, uh, in, the, in the numbers there in 13, FY13, there were 11 um, proposals submitted total from Georgia, only four in 2014, and then seven uh, in 2015. So the trend is up, but um, again, except for Florida that has far more population, uh, Georgia has the second highest population, but uh, Georgia is being beaten out on the number of proposals by some, uh, some quite a few other states. And I don't need to name all of them there, but Quite a few other states have more proposals in place. And again, we think that's because of uh, the outreach that is done, not only by my staff, but by uh, the coordinators within those state programs and just you know, what might be happening within the real estate community in, in those particular states. It does vary from year to year, so there are a lot of reasons for why uh, the numbers of proposals um, ebb and flow over, over the years. We also put together just a, a, a small graph here to show where the proposals were submitted from within the state of Georgia in 2015. I know this is really difficult to, to read. Um, and we've included also the percent poverty estimates, um, at least in 2013. And that goes from yellow being the, the lower percent of poverty to the, the darker number. Uh, the darker the colors are, 36 or more percent uh, shows the, the sort of a poverty belt coming across Georgia. And there weren't any proposals from some of the, the, uh, the colors that are there and, and uh, that are a little bit darker or, or red. And then one more. Um, awarded proposals in 2013 and 14 within Georgia, uh, showing you where those were and it's interesting, as, as Beth said, there are, there are contaminated properties throughout the, the state. Certainly the, uh, the metro area doesn't have a, a stranglehold on contamination and, and properties that need to be cleaned up. And so our challenge is how do we reach out to those smaller communities? How do we reach out to uh, the development authorities and uh, the commissions, county commissions, one of the things that we intend to try to do is to focus a little bit more on, for example, county commissions and development authorities, um, along with the smaller communities that they service, because we've, what we've observed over the years is that even though we have, um, within our ranking factors, a, a, um, a um, preference uh, is given to first-time grantees, very oftentimes those grantees might not be very familiar with the process itself of handling a grant. And so it requires a lot of hands-on from us, whereas if it's a development authority or a county organization that is working with those smaller communities, they frequently do have at least a lot more experience with working with grants. Um, so the money gets to those smaller communities, but uh, without quite so much overhead time on, on our part or, or the state's part. So that's one of the things we would like to do, certainly here in Georgia working with Beth on outreach, um, and planning for that outreach because we're not that far away from the next cycle of proposals uh, being due, um, as, as you all know, generally when those, when those come through. And so with that, that uh, concludes with the numbers that I wanted to share with you. And Gerald, I'll turn it back over to you. Touch. 
Thank you, Alan. And, and first, what I'd like to do is ask for questions uh, from the crowd. I, I have a few that, that uh, would like to ask as well, but what questions do we have? Yes, Chet. First of all, I think, I think Beth, you and, and your predecessors are to be commended, and, and particularly with what y'all have done recently, to take what contaminated property could fall into six different programs, one EPA and five state programs a few years ago, and, and to now move it forward. And I want to go back further. Um, in 1990, Copper Hill, Tennessee, which was right on the Georgia border, 100 years of mining had left the property totally denuded. And EPA, interestingly enough, under the Superfund law, was facing a town in bankruptcy, a hospital in bankruptcy, and the largest employer in the area in bankruptcy. Um, and through a mistake, I had the good fortune to uh, represent them. Uh, they thought they were getting another lawyer. But um, EPA agreed to let my client not do a type five, but simply plant trees not do any cleanup of soil, any invest, there was plenty of investigation already. Mining sites, you know, it was obvious. But just plant trees, a lot of trees. Um, and it's been a tremendous success. If you go by there now, you see, you see them. Now granted it was Tennessee, not Georgia, but it was right on the border. And granted there was a lot of congressional support, senators and representatives. But my question is this, if Georgia were faced with a situation where a company said, we want to acquire this property, but we are unwilling to remove, to investigate the soil and remove all the source materials, we might do some testing, we might do certain things, but you're still gonna have contamination there. Would Georgia be willing to do what EPA stepped up and did along with Tennessee? in 1990, which was a significant contribution to employment, economy, and the health of the environment. That question to me, Chet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna get Derek Williams now. Um, so I, I can't speak for EPA, but I think the first question would be, you know, is it the responsible party or is it a prospective purchaser because... Okay, okay. Well. I'm going to answer your question in a roundabout way. I think that there, um, we have had prospective purchasers come in and want to do um, more out of the box type of techniques, sort of what you're talking about, almost a bioremediation. Can we plant something to take the contamination out of the ground? And we're willing to listen to that. It has been so novel, it has just come in the last month or so. Um, but we're willing to listen to that in terms of a corrective action. You know, I, I think in terms of a liability perspective, receiving that limitation of liability is um, you know, contingent on performing that corrective action or removing soil and source material. That's what our statute says, so we can't really get around that. But if there is a corrective action in terms of bioremediation that has been proven successful, I think we're open to listening to that. Okay. Other questions? Yes. So. I know you've been getting a lot of questions about vapor, and uh, I have another, but full disclosure, I have a lot of background knowledge on vapor and how the EPA is addressing it. Uh, my question is, what is the measuring stick against which we are comparing to see if uh, vapor evaluation has been sufficiently performed? And the reason I ask is I see a lot of uh, caps that are requiring that by the end vapor is assessed or evaluated, and also a lot of caps, uh, CSRs, that that wasn't uh, provision in the original cap, but when we go to close it out, uh, there's a requirement that vapor is evaluated. What is the measuring stick that we're evaluating against? What does the state want us to evaluate against? Did everybody hear that question? Which, which is really, what's the benchmark that we're comparing in terms of an endpoint for vapor? Uh, that's a good question, and I don't know that I'm the best person to fully address it, but I know that you know if we're looking at um, 
a corrective action plan or a property that has proposed corrective action and they're trying to propose a certain risk reduction standard, you know, a residential or a non-residential standard. We usually will send that to our risk assessment groups. And so a lot of times if you're receiving comments back about additional vapor assessment might be needed, it's, it's coming from the risk assessment group and trying to comply with those risk reduction standards, either for residential or non-residential. Uh, again, we are in a period of uncertainty. We really don't have uh, guidelines from the EPA or within the state that, sh that show us how to do this. So I think we're, we're moving um, toward that. But again, at this point, we're, we're mostly looking at what is the risk and trying to manage, assess those risks, one, and then manage the risk, two. And, and in defense of, uh, and in defense of Georgia, that, that's not unique to just Georgia. Uh, many, if not most states, are still in that same evolution process with regard to vapor. Uh, other questions? Let, let me ask one, uh, and Beth, I'll stick with you. What is the, uh, we've talked a lot about how quickly you all respond. What's the uh, greatest strain either now or that you see down the road on your resources and your continued ability to respond? And by well, you, I mean the program. Yeah, well, first of all, I have um, the staff at the Brownfield program is, is phenomenal, and I won't ask them to stand up, but because I told them that I wouldn't. <laughs> but they, they really are the best, and they are the, they're the ones that uh, take credit for, the, for those numbers that you saw. Um, I think our, our biggest strain is they, they work like mad. They are always on, you know, they're trying to be so efficient, and they will get it done. But I think we have uh, a lot of uncertainty with when we receive projects. So we have a lot of projects out for corrective action, and that's ongoing. And then we receive a CSR, and then you know, that, that sort of puts everything on hold. And I think the biggest strain on our resources is when we have a deadline that is very, very tight with reviewing the compliance status report, which is the final, uh, final thing, and, and turning around the limitation of liability. So that, that probably taxes us the most. Now, I mean, they, they absolutely do it, but there's, there's also an unpredictability there. We don't know when we're gonna get that, you know, that ASAP. Everybody submits their, their um, CSR with an ASAP on there, so, um, you know, get in line. But uh, no, I think that, that that's one of those things where you just don't know what's gonna come down the pike, and just trying to assess that is, it can be difficult. And I assume that is, uh that concern is magnified as you near your end. Sure, and actually, I will say that um, you know it's always it's always going to be connected to the real estate market. We're going to rise and fall with the real estate market. But one thing that we did see because of the 30-day wind or the uh, relate back period is December was busy, but January was really very busy. busy because people had that extra right. breathing room to not get their PP cap in. They said, okay, well, I've got 30 days. Yeah. So I, that is sort of spacing or elongating our busy season, which I think is, I don't know, good or bad, but it's, you know, it's, it is happening, so. Alan, on, uh, on, on the grant side, uh, what have you seen to be the most effective use of the grants in terms of, of translating the, the grant money or revolving loan money being made available and used versus an end product where you have either cleanup taking place or cleanup in conjunction with some form of development or redevelopment take, or, or other use of that facility taking place? So, yeah, one of, one of the things that I, I didn't mention up front but probably should have is that our grants are relatively small. When you talk about $200,000 for an assessment, um, you know, somewhere between two hundred dollars or $400,000 max, whether it's a, um, depending on the type of grant that we're giving out for cleanups or assessment, not a lot. That's really just seed money. And what we try to do, my staff and uh, Beth and her counterparts within state organizations try to do is work with the grantees on how they're going to utilize that money and find the developers and interested parties to come in and make good use of it. And so the, the leveraging that takes place is quite impressive. And um, mm -hmm. what, if, if you haven't seen what, what those dollars can do for leveraging, uh, the grant dollars can do for leveraging, it's really quite impressive, the number of jobs that are created and the amount of acres that are cleaned up are phenomenal. But it's really not from our $200,000 grants. 
right. or even the revolving loan fund grants, that's just getting things started. What is, uh, you've got an audience of 170 people here, you have the George Bradford Association. What, one of the issues that you identified, which I think really resonated, is outside of Metro Atlanta. Mm -hmm. How do we clean up, how do we work with these communities outside of Metro Atlanta and give us an idea about what, what we ought to be doing and how we can help with that? Well, it's a, it's a, it's a challenge for all of us. It, it truly is. Uh, Cindy and Mike Norman, um, her boss, my branch chief, and I have discussed that often because we have responsibilities for outreach to small communities throughout um, the region, including within Georgia. And what we are trying to do, as I mentioned, is try to reach out to the development authorities and county commissions and, and organizations that can help us get that, get that message out. Because we can't possibly uh, reach all of the, the mayors and, and the county commissioners here within Georgia, mm -hmm. 159 of them. So we, we try hard to find a way through the associations um, and, and others just to let our message get, get placed out there. The Association of County Commissioners of Georgia, Georgia Municipal Association, and others. Uh, Holly, the, uh, any, any other questions from the, the crowd before I ask Holly? Uh, having gone through this legislative session uh, and, and having seen what has occurred both this session, 2014, and, and early ones, what would be the change, if there was one additional change you could make for the Brownfield law, what would that change be? Um, well, first let me say, I do think it is working. The numbers that Beth put up there are very positive. So obviously the law and, the, um, and what doesn't have regulations, but what um, Beth's program is doing, it's working. I think um, the limitation of liability is very unique to our state and very positive, and it has been there. I think that's been there from the beginning of the statute, and, and I think that's worked very well. I think it has helped um, make the transaction happen a lot of times and for lenders. Um, that's one place, if I'm remembering, my, I hope I'm not getting my statutes mixed up, but lender liability, I think there are some oddities in there that maybe could come more in line with uh, CERCLA. The other thing is we've mentioned the VRP, and I don't know that this would, you said one, didn't you, sorry. Um, I don't know that this would take a statutory change, but we're hopeful that some of the risk-based tools and techniques under the VRP can apply to the brownfield sites. Did I see one other question? Well, I, I, before it closed, I do want to note two things. One, I want to thank Kelly for what she has done putting this program together. I really want to give a special. <laughs> and, 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 then, and then second, I also want to uh, thank the program chair, Heather, who, as, as many of y'all know, is a partner of mine and who uh, has not uh, said I can't work on a file because I'm preparing for the Brown, preparing the Brown, not that I would listen to her if she had, but she has, uh, <laughs> has, has not turned one down, which I know has involved a lot of extra work. So to, to both of you, uh, a heartfelt thanks to, the, uh, to our panel. Thank you so much for the insight. And I'm sure you all be staying around at least for part of the, of the day. So please uh, feel free to ask any questions uh, that you may have of them over the rest of the, uh, over the, rest of the program. And I'll turn it over to the, uh, uh, I think we're going, is it lunch? Dan, what's the next? Okay. Well, big thanks to Gerald and Beth and Holly and Alan for a great presentation. Um, we are going, oh, excuse me. to break for lunch right now. Um, 
I believe that the caterer is still bringing some more food, so it may be a couple minutes, so um, use this time to network and um, take other breaks. Um, we are starting back at 12 o'clock with our keynote speaker, and I just want to mention a couple other things. First is I think AMEC ran a little short on their sponsorship presentation, so those are the slides running behind me. And um, second is, is that as you may leave and during the afternoon sessions, we hope you stay all day, but in case you do have to leave, just make sure to drop off your visitor badge. You'll probably hear me say that again. And lastly, before I get to you, Stacy, um, is, is that um, we want to have an, wanted to have an opportunity to continue the networking after the event, so we did set up an informal happy hour at Manuel's Tavern um, after this event today. So Stacy, did you have something to add? So see you back at noon.
other regional offices, in nine regional offices, they all have their brownfields program within their Superfund division. Ours is within what used to be called a resource conservation.